I'm here to talk about healthcare reform, and I decided to uh, focus on what should be done and why it should be done, and maybe some of this will be done. And I'm going to show a lot of slides and a lot of data on the slides, a lot of charts. So uh, it would be, it's going to either wake you up or put you to sleep if you're not interested. But if you pay attention, there's a ton of information here. And uh, I'll entertain questions afterwards. Uh, to, to start the talk, I, I like to use this slide, uh, which is, a quote from Senator Moynihan, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not his own facts. And there's no area of public policy where so much misinformation has been propagated and people have such strenuous opinions about things that they really uh, don't know the facts about. So I'm gonna go through a lot of facts and we'll, we'll, we'll derive the opinions from that. There's a big contradiction in today's uh, discussions about healthcare. And that is that when you ask people how to rate their own experience of healthcare in the United States, the overwhelming majority are and always have been very uh, satisfied. Uh, but interestingly, and I think it's a contradiction, the same percentage of people say the system needs fundamental change or complete rebuilding. And I think this is an illustration of the misinformation in the discussion when people have their own experience they know that the United States has, as I will show you from data, and you can read afterwards, uh, the best healthcare in the world. Now, there is another fact that is absolutely true, and that is that the US spends more on healthcare than anywhere else, and that is either on the basis of per person or as a percent of GDP. The question really is, what do we get for the money? And a, an argument that we don't get much was inferred from this World Health Organization report and it came out in the year 2000. And uh, it's still being, uh, being relied on. And what's being relied on in this study was the uh, ranking of 191 countries. And as you can see here, the US ranked 37th. Uh, even if we weren't spending a lot of money, that's not very good. And uh, the first thing I would do when I look at this is I would say, well, you know, we're in the group of countries, the not really paradigms of healthcare quality, if you look at who's in the ranking around the United States, and even if you look at who's at the top of the ranking, these countries are not known to have very good healthcare. So you think, well, maybe there's something wrong with the ranking. And there is something wrong with the ranking, and that is that about two-thirds of the rank is based on equality, not quality. That is, if everyone got a C, that's better than if some people got an A and some people got a C. The system is better if everyone got a C according to their ranking. And there's another problem, and that is that this study has been thoroughly destroyed in the academic literature by health policy experts. In fact, this is just a smattering of the uh, peer-reviewed papers that have pointed out that not only was there a ranking based upon equality, not quality, but there were highly subjective inputs assumptions were made about their relative importance. When data was missing, which it was from dozens of countries, it was literally filled in by the researchers on what they thought the so-called data would be. And this is the truth. There were huge measurement errors that had no statistically significant difference, yet they were still presented as a concrete ranking. And many of the most important inputs really don't reflect healthcare quality at all. What do I mean by that? Well, this is one very, very good example of a very coarse statistic, life expectancy. And you might think intuitively, hey, you know, I mean, this is an obvious reflection of healthcare quality. And in fact, our current elected officials, even those who are working on healthcare legislation, don't really understand this. Uh, and that is that there's a lot of things that go into life expectancy. Because first of all, not everyone dies from an illness. In fact, a lot of people, it turns out, in the United States die from an immediate death from gunshot wound to the head or homicide, suicide or homicide. And in fact, you'd think, well, I mean, so does every country, but not exactly. When the uh, OECD countries are ranked, and OECD are basically the economically uh, developed countries of the world, the US is near the bottom. Uh, of life expectancy, when you just take all 
uh, commerce. When you standardize all the countries for immediate gunshot wound to the head or immediate death from high-speed motor vehicle accident, just standardize every country for the same rate, which researchers did, here's what happened. The United States had the highest life expectancy. No rational person would say that a suicide would count against the healthcare system. Now, health analysts don't like to talk about the OECD report. In fact, the, o, uh, the WHO report, in fact, the OECD, which is basically, uh, generally speaking, a liberal think tank, said it, this report is one of those things we wish would go away. It's so flawed, uh, it's really been discredited, yet it's still talked about as if it were a legitimate ranking. Here are the facts, and I'm not, I don't have time, obviously, to go through all the facts, uh, but I did write a book on the facts, and this is a 500 references book that you can buy. I don't make anything from it, really, so it's not, I'm not selling a book. But the facts show that we have the best gold standard, really, healthcare system in the world. If you talk about healthcare in terms of what I'm talking about here, best survivals from cancer, best survivals from other serious diseases, best access to treatment, best treatment results for all chronic diseases, best access to screening tests, best access to drugs, best access to accurate diagnostic modern medical technology, the quickest access to surgeries that are not only life-saving but life-changing, the fastest access to specialists, and anyone here who's sick knows that there's no person in modern medical care that has serious disease that is treated by a GP. It just doesn't work that way, and I'm an MD, and I know exactly how the medical care system works in the US, and that's appropriate since specialists are the only ones that have the training and understanding of when and how to use modern diagnostic and treatment strategies. We have the fastest access to specialists, but we also have the source and are the source of the world's leading innovations by every single metric. Here's just a few examples. Cancer rates, US versus the countries in Western Europe that are held up as the models for healthcare. We have a statistically significant better outcome, in fact, the best outcome in the world in the peer reviewed literature on every major cancer and almost every single rare cancer. What about access to treatment? We'll take the most important chronic disease that there is high blood pressure. 53% of people in the US are receiving treatment. This is access to care if they already are known to have high blood pressure. And of course, the New York Times pointed out that this isn't so great, but they went further. They said this is shocking evidence of how our complicated dysfunctional healthcare system cannot deliver recommended care. They didn't bother to look at the rest of the countries in the study. Because when you look at the countries that are purported to have better healthcare, England, Sweden, Germany, Spain, Italy, Canada, we dwarf them in terms of access to treatment for high blood pressure. What about the outcome, successful medical care? We have a statistically significant higher, better outcome cure of high, or at least control of high blood pressure compared to every one of those countries. In fact, the OECD itself said, clearly the US has the most diagnosed high blood pressure, but also the fewest people with high, measured high levels because of the use of drugs. That's called better medical care by data. What about access to screening tests? You would think that a government-controlled system would at least be able to do that. This is something that's non-emergency, just get people screened for the most important cancers. And when you look at the data, in this case comparing the US to Canada, you see that for every single important cancer screening test, mammogram, pap smear, PSA, colonoscopy, sigmoidoscopy, the US has better access to screening tests than the government-controlled system in Canada. If it's so good, why would, we, why would we reform US healthcare? Well, there's several important reasons. One, there are demographic realities. We have a remarkably aging population, and we harbor a massive number of risk factors, particularly but not exclusively from obesity, which means if we don't do anything, the system will be completely overwhelmed. Secondly, the public plans that we have are unsustainable, and failing, and I'm gonna go through why that's true. The Affordable Care Act, or what people sometimes call Obamacare, has instituted harmful, misguided regulations that specifically have caused higher insurance premiums and consolidation throughout the healthcare industry. 
including doctor's practices, hospitals, even insurers. That has reduced competition and choice, and that's always bad for consumers. The wrong incentives have been in place for decades, and they were doubled down by the Affordable Care Act, both economic and health-related, and I'll go through that. The Affordable Care Act expanded government insurance, okay, and I'm going to show you by how much. Yet it's private insurance, not government insurance, that actually gives you access, broad access to care. And another big reason is that the Affordable Care Act is promulgating what I call a two-tiered system that isolates the most vulnerable people in our society from the excellence of America's medical care and wastes hundreds of billions of dollars of taxpayer money. And this is very important because I think this is not a partisan issue. And so uh, here I think there's some common ground. There are two very important realities before we talk about what should be done and why it should be done. Number one, successful Medicaid reform, which is the program for poor people, depends on reforms to the entire system. If you don't do it that way, you get what they have in other countries, like the NHS in England, who I don't know how many people have been here there, where there's a parallel system of private care, and virtually everyone who can afford it, which means, in fact, more than 80% of people who make over $80,000 a year in the UK use private insurance and private care. They avoid their NHS system because it's inferior, as I'll show you. And the other essential reality is specifically it's the poor who will suffer the most if somehow we pursue this inexplicable rationale for single-payer health care because it is truly only the poor that will be unable to circumvent that system. Nobody in this room will use that system, I guarantee it. Projected health care spending. Okay, when you look at projections, and of course projections never come true because of the thing that goes into the projections do change, we know this. But if you look at the projections, and these are the projections of spending, and the black line here is the federal tax revenues. The revenues, the money has no, the, the government has no money. They take money from you, that's their money that they use. We know this, I have to explain this to my children all the time. <laughs> and this is about what they take. They, they have about 17, 18, 19% of GDP is their revenues. And if nothing changes in health care, by 2049, all of their money, all the federal dollars, will be taken up by Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security. There will be no money left, zero, for any domestic program, for national defense, for anything else. So we know that's unsustainable. Now, what did the Affordable Care Act focus on? And this is really a, a very important, I think, to understand. It focused on increasing the number of people with insurance. And it did that by centralizing government authority over health care. And it did that by adding a number of regulations and mandates. I'm not going to go through all these, but mandates on individuals and businesses, regulations on private insurance, regulations directly and indirectly that impacted health care payments, and roughly 21 new taxes totaling over $500 billion over the decade. That's how it did that. And what did it do with, uh, what did it spend money on? The Affordable Care Act spent roughly $2 trillion over a decade, and half of it, roughly a trillion dollars, rounding off here, is uh, spent on subsidizing private insurance through the Obamacare exchanges, and roughly a trillion dollars is spent on expanding Medicaid. Now, is it working? This really isn't arguable anymore, but I'll show you uh, some of the statements here. Uh, is it working? Well, it definitely did decrease the percent of people who were uninsured. There's no question about that. Now, it did that by markedly expanding the number of people on Medicaid. 60 to 84 percent, depending upon what you read, and I said 60 here, of the people who are newly insured under Obamacare are insured through Medicaid. Did it reduce health care expenditures? Well, there's a headline here in the Washington Post from one of the advisors to uh, President Obama, health care law success story, slowing down medical costs. 
And then you look at the numbers, and this is the healthcare spending over time. And this is the US, and since the uh, implementation or since the initial signing of uh, the law, there was a plateauing or a slight decrease. By the way, this is an illustration of Washington speak. They think that a decrease in the rate of growth is a decrease. Okay, there's, a, there's a nuance, but a very important difference there. But in any event, we'll give them that. There's a, there's a plateauing here of the US healthcare spending. The problem is that there's a plateauing of every country in the world of healthcare spending. Now you have to be all in on the success of Obamacare to think that Obamacare caused healthcare spending to slow in every country in the world. And in fact, the OECD itself that generated the data said that the reason that healthcare, slow, healthcare spending slowed was because of the economic crisis of 2008. We have evidence that that's also true in the US. When you look at what happens following the recessions that are outlined here in the shaded blue, every time there's been an economic recession historically in the United States, there is a slowing in the rate of health expenditures in the country. And when the recession has recovered, as it is now, the rate of healthcare spending increases. Okay, we know this. No, it is not working. Why do I say that? Well, because health insurance uh, premiums have exploded. Millions of people, in fact, 10 times the initial projections, will have been kicked off of their chosen insurance plan. There is a shrinking number of doctors and hospitals that even accept the Obamacare insurance, as we read about, I hope, in the news every day. There is a marked loss of insurance choices for those that are dependent on Obamacare exchanges. We're spending a trillion dollars for expanding Medicaid uh, and it's a failing program, and there has been a very harmful secondary effect, the so-called unintended consequence, which is a consolidation because of the regulations of doctor practices and hospitals that actually raises prices. It's harmful to consumers. The problem is uh, there is a big disconnect in healthcare reform, and this is not a one party or the other. Both parties don't seem to understand this. Politicians focus on making health insurance more affordable, as if that's the primary goal. And they do that by, in the Obamacare model, subsidizing consumers and putting in regulations, direct cash to buy insurance. And in the GOP models that have been put forth, uh, they've done it through what are called refundable tax credits, which is basically cash, okay? The problem is that insurance premiums are secondary. That's not the primary thing. Insurance premiums reflect the cost of medical care, mainly, and the regulatory environment. In fact, you can give a rough estimate that about 80% of an insurance plan is due to the cost of medical care. Now, since the Obamacare law went into place, the increase in premiums is mainly, overwhelmingly, due to the new regulatory environment. The primary goal of health reform should be to reduce the costs of medical care. Everything else follows. And by everything else, I mean access to care, insurance premiums, and even the cost of government insurance programs. If the cost of medical care was lower, everything else becomes easier and more broadly available. The key is the small print here. Without harming access, quality, or innovation. We know in, pay in countries with centralized, single-payer health care, there is one and only one way that they restrain costs of health care. That is to limit health care. That's why there are uh, unconscionable, really, delays for care. People die while waiting for care. They have worse health care outcomes than we do. And in fact, the solution, as I'll outline later, don't want to give away the punchline here, is that the solution to the failing systems of single-payer health care is they take taxpayer money and they pay for private care. And sometimes even in neighboring countries, this is not understood by the people advocating single-payer health care here. How do we lower the cost of health care? Just like the prices come down in every other good or service in the United States. The same reason that that supercomputer in your pocket that you call a phone costs hundreds of dollars, not $20,000. And that's by instilling competition 
and the correct incentives. These are the steps. And this is in the Wall Street Journal piece I wrote a week ago, and uh, you can read about that. Uh, I talked about this a little bit actually on TV this morning on Stuart Varney, who's my favorite TV guy, if anybody watches that show. The key steps to reduce the price of medical care. Incentivize people to care about the price of medical care. No one cares about the price of medical care. No one here asks, really, I bet, or very, almost no one, what the price of something is. Why? Because our model is that insurance is designed to minimize out-of-pocket payment. If someone else is paying, why would you even ask about the price? In fact, we use health care without knowing the price. It's the only good or service that you've actually used without knowing what the price is, and then you find out weeks later what it costs. The second point is to increase the supply of medical care and stimulate competition for people who are empowered with being in control of the money, the patients. And the third is to reform the tax code to eliminate what are counterproductive, harmful incentives that have been there for years. Now, how do we judge what will happen, or at least what President Trump is thinking what he wants to do? By the appointments he's made. That's how I judge it because nothing really significant except for today was done. I'd be happy to answer questions about that. He appointed Tom Price as HHS secretary, who's actually very good at his knowledge of health care, has designed a health care reform proposal that is somewhat similar in a lot of ways to what I designed, and he's a very articulate guy. Uh, unfortunately, he's gone. Seema Verma, uh, is the head of CMS, Medicare and Medicaid Services. She's very good. Uh, she was the brains behind some of the state-based reforms for Medicaid that were in concert with, again, things that I've proposed, which are changing Medicaid to private insurance model instead of a separate parallel system that doctors don't accept. And the third person is the head of the FDA, who's a friend of mine and colleague on some of the campaigns we work together on, who's very good, Scott Gottlieb, who understands very important problems in the FDA with drug approval that will be, I think, important and change, change the way, uh, at least improve the access to drugs and lower cost. Now, here's what I think the principal aims of President Trump's health care reforms are. Rolling back regulations and Affordable Care Act taxes. And, and actually, some of that was done by executive order today, uh, which you can read about or will read about. It's on every station. Uh, health savings accounts will be significantly expanded. Tax reform will be done, and if they do get through, judging from what they've proposed, it will include something called refundable tax credits. And despite the fact that it's a bad idea to do that, in my opinion, for a lot of reasons, handing money out to voters is irresistible to a politician. And so that's, that's going to be done. Medicare will not be touched. For all of you who are in Medicare or nearly eligible for Medicare, I can guarantee that nothing is going to change with Medicare, even though it's essential that it does change. They're not going to do it. Medicaid will be transformed, uh, and the way I think they're going to do it is they're going to, as they've proposed already, trying to delegate power to the states because it is in theory uh, and in somewhat in practice a state-based program, although you have to realize that Medicaid, the program for poor people, uh, is about 60% paid out of the federal government, even though it's called a state-based program. And then healthcare innovation will be facilitated with some deregulation and incentivized because that's right up the alley of the current president. Now, the first illustration is this. This is the Affordable Care Act, and it's a pretty big law, as you can see in the picture here. And we know that President Trump talks a lot about deregulation, and this is an example of the size, literally, of the proposal from the House of Representatives. There will be significant streamlining of regulations in any health care reform that's done. Uh, this is my plan, and you can read about it if you want to. It's free on the Hoover website, uh, Restoring Quality Health Care. Uh, I'm going to go through very quickly what should be done. Number one, expand affordable private insurance. We know that more than 5 million Americans have already lost their chosen private insurance because of the regulatory requirements of Obamacare, and 10 million Americans will eventually be forced off as these uh, years go on. That's a problem. Why is that a problem? Because 
you have expanded government insurance far more than what existed in the population beforehand compared to expanding private insurance. And this is a problem for two, at least, big reasons. Number one, doctors don't accept the government programs that you're expanding. This is 2008 data where a third of doctors already, of primary care doctors, did not accept new Medicaid patients. You can expand an insurance program all you want. You can stamp someone's forehead and say, you are insured. But if you can't get medical care, to me, that's, that's really a sham and unconscionable, one of my favorite words, to celebrate that kind of thing as an achievement when it's not really accessible for medical care. There's another problem with shifting people to government insurance, and that is there's a massive cost shift to private insurance. This is the underpayment of government insurance versus per year compared to private insurance pre-Obamacare, and here's post-Obamacare. There's a dramatic increase in the underpayment by government insurance compared to private insurance. That cost shift is significant. In fact, a family of four using private insurance in 2008 numbers was already paying almost $2,000 extra because of that cost shift. Because you have to realize government insurance pays less than cost of care. Okay, so if you want to wipe out private insurance and make it unaffordable, you'd put more and more people on government insurance because that makes private insurance paying all that underpayment. But the, the Democrats, when they proposed uh, the Affordable Care Act, they said, but we're not using a government insurance model. We're putting private insurance on exchanges. And this is a so-called Republican idea. And health, mar health insurance exchanges are actually a good idea. They work in when private companies get together and put up insurance plans. That actually works in giving people choice and people spend less money when they want to. But then there was this part of it. The Affordable Care Act added a tremendous number of regulations to any insurance that was deemed approved to be on the exchange. Okay, and that regulatory environment not only caused insurance to be expensive, but it caused insurers, now we see it, to withdraw from the marketplace. Because they're, they're not going to sell a product they lose money on, obviously. And when you look closely, at the insurance that people even buy, their a choice of doctors and hospitals is significantly less than it used to be. Here's some data. Here's the private health insurance premiums in the after the first year, full year of full implementation of the Obamacare exchange rules. Average U.S. county, the premiums went up 49 percent. Okay, this is what's happened in the in the first four years. Individuals families, the premiums have exploded. At the same time as deductibles have increased. Everybody here probably understands that a deductible is the amount you pay until your insurance kicks in. If the deductibles are higher, usually the premiums are lower. But here we had the worst of that. We had premiums explode and deductibles explode. In fact, the Affordable Care Act specifically preferentially, in a way, harmed high deductible plans. That's my data on the rate of increase of premiums, depending on what type of health care plan. Now, I said that the Affordable Care Act insurance has reduced the access to doctors and hospitals, and that's true. The year before the full implementation, a third of, in, of individual health plans had what are called narrow or ultra-narrow doctor networks that accepted the insurance. First year out, now it's doubled. 70% of Affordable Care Act exchange plans had what's called a narrow or ultra-narrow network. And let's just, as a concrete example, look at cancer care. This is one of the gems of the American healthcare system, okay? It turns out that 13 of 19 of the top cancer hospitals in the United States were not accepting the Obamacare exchange insurance. So you think you're gonna be seen at Sloan Kettering or MD Anderson or Stanford no, you have insurance, but doesn't cover where you think it covers. This goes further. The networks of doctors that accept the Obamacare insurance 
42% fewer oncologists than if you bought private insurance outside Obamacare. 42% fewer cardiologists, a third less psychiatrists and primary care providers, 24% fewer hospitals. That's what we mean by narrow network. The insurance choices have continued to decrease. This is 2015. Only 7% of counties had one insurer on their exchange available, and two-thirds had three or more insurance choices. 2017, only two years later, with the regulations of Obamacare, look at the change here. Almost 40% uh, uh, now, actually, for next year, it's not even on the graph, are only going to have one insurance plan possible, one insurance provider in your county. The key to lowering insurance premiums is to reduce regulations and to create incentives to seek value. What do I mean by that? High deductibles are very important to reduce the price of medical care. It's not for everyone. It's not a panacea. But if you're paying directly, you care what you're paying. This doesn't even need to be argued, really. This is true in everything we do. And high deductibles actually restore the true purpose of health insurance. Health insurance, and any insurance, is to reduce the risk of financial loss, large and unanticipated. It's not to subsidize. You don't buy homeowner's insurance to pay for your light bulbs, right? That's not the purpose of insurance. There are other ways to give people money for routine and small expenses, but that's not the purpose of insurance. And when you require all insurance to be bloated with those kinds of mandated coverages, all insurance becomes very expensive. In addition, that type of insurance model instills harmful incentives because everything is paying, you don't care what it costs. And you actually use more health care when you don't even need it. We know that high deductible plans decrease spending. It's a fact. This is not an opinion. There are studies on this. It decreases spending by about 15% per year, and it doesn't harm patients because people think about what they're doing. And there's nothing wrong with that. There is nothing that's free. So you have to you know, at least seek value. A third of savings for people who use high deductible plans are due to lower costs per utilization. In other words, they're shopping around. And actually, Americans want lower cost insurance. They want higher deductibles. It's the fastest growing type of insurance. And the last I heard, we had a representative government. Now, this is a very fundamental economic principle, and we're in the econ building here. So when people have choices and are consciously spending their own money, they make value-based decisions. Okay, this is obvious, but somehow needs to be stated. Second reform is to markedly liberalize and enlarge health savings accounts. Why? Because health savings accounts, which are tax-sheltered accounts, that can be used on health care expenses, reduce the cost of medical care. Why do I say that? Because they, they're proven to. Another 15% beyond high deductible plans. In addition, people with health savings accounts use wellness programs more frequently because they're interested in saving the money. They have a motivation. And so they use wellness programs, and these are validated wellness programs that improve health from the data. Health savings accounts is a little bit esoteric, but this is a better tax uh, proposal than having a deduction for health care. Because while the, while the contribution to health savings accounts is deductible, it, it does something else. It incentivizes saving money. It makes you price conscious. And Americans want HSAs. There's a record number of people putting in money into HSAs. I talk about decreasing the price of medical care. Is it even practical? I mean, if you're having crushing chest pain in an ambulance, you're not going to shop around for care. Okay, we know that. But we also know that only 5 to 6% of medical care expenditures are emergency. 5 to 6%. In fact, roughly 60% of medical care expenditures for people under 65 are outpatient outpatient elective things you can shop for. I guarantee you, if Stanford and UCSF published their prices of MRI and made it visible because people demanded it because you were spending your own money, 
there would be competition and prices would come down. What about the people who really use most of medical care? Top 1% of, of people spend 25% of the money on health care. Aren't these people? Because they spend a lot of money, way more than a health savings account. They spend $100,000 a year on average. But the thing is that the top 1%, 45% of their expenditures are outpatient. So they're, they're going to look at prices. Now, three, instill the appropriate incentives in the tax code. We know that the tax code as it sits now, where there's an unlimited exclusion of your employer-provided health benefits, is one of the biggest mistakes in the tax code because it incentivizes people to spend more money on health care. It makes your health care dollar more valuable than any other dollar. And people don't realize it, but you know, if we clamp down on that write-off or that income exclusion, people say, oh, well, then I would lose all the money. Well, not really, because uh, most people may not realize it, but your benefits from your employer, they're taken out. They replace take-home wages. No one's giving you extra money. Your take-home wages are lower when your benefits are higher, generally. Now, I'm not going to go through this in detail, but I just want to point out point number one here. Why wouldn't I want refundable tax credits like the Republicans are proposing? This is the main reason. Because giving people money to pay for the wrong type of insurance, which means bloated comprehensive insurance that minimizes concern for the cost of the care, if you prop that up by giving them money, you're, not, you're, you're encouraging the wrong incentives. It's not just the 250 or $300 billion a year that, tax, uh, that that tax break costs the government. Modernize Medicare. This is why I say it's urgent. Not only is the population over 65 dramatically increasing over the next 25 years, but look at the population over 85 in yellow here. This is what's called the oldest old. Now, this is a great thing, that we're living longer, okay? But as everyone knows, it doesn't come in complete health. People that are older are using more medical care. This is the data on what you use in medical care versus your age. It's not free. When you have people live longer, that, that, there's a downside to that in terms of the cost of that. So uh, we could look at even one disease, Alzheimer's, okay, which is probably the biggest public health problem in the world, I think that's reasonable to say, projections are 2050, we in the United States alone will spend over a trillion dollars if nothing changes with Alzheimer's. And that's a problem not just for individuals, it's a problem for the government, right? Because a massive amount is through Medicare, because people with Alzheimer's generally are over 65. In fact, dementia, cognitive impairment with Alzheimer's, is now more expensive already to society in the US than the total cost of heart disease and cancer combined. Just that one disease. And this is this aging population. This is really something that is uh, almost frightening, really. The other problem with Medicare. People say, oh, Medicare is great. But there's another reality. And the reality is this. When Medicare started, Medicare was being paid by the working population. And there were 4.6 workers per user of Medicare. That's how it's funded. Look what's happened over the years. It's down to about half. It's unsustainable, even if Medicare were good. Medicare hospitalization fund, if you will, is projected to be gone, completely bankrupt, in about 15 years. Less than 15 years, really. There's another problem with Medicare. People think it's so good, and the problem is that doctors already are starting to not accept Medicare patients. 20% of primary care doctors in 2008 didn't accept new Medicare patients. Now, over half don't accept new Medicare patients. And we have this bolus of aging people coming into the Medicare eligible population. One thing that Medicare is very good at, denying claims. If you look at this data here, Medicare, not private insurance, rejects is near or at the top of the chart every single year, not these private insurers, in rejecting claims. 
not to mention $60 billion a year in fraud, waste, and abuse. Yet we have people saying Medicare for all. By the way, about 80% of people with Medicare realize it's not so good. They buy private insurance to supplement it. There are very few people that just have Medicare alone, traditional Medicare insurance. Five, change Medicaid so that these people have the same access to care that everybody else does. And that means through private insurance. This is the expansion of Medicaid. It's generally under Obamacare, essentially all adults. It has nothing to do with children or disabled. I gave you some data from 2008 that about a third of primary care doctors didn't accept Medicaid. When you look at this of 15 major metropolitan areas, about 45% of doctors did not accept new Medicaid patients in 2009, 2013. 54% of doctors do not accept new Medicaid patients in 2013. This is even more compelling to me. This is a study that I dug up that was put out by the Health and Human Services, the government department itself. It was their study. These are the doctors who accept Medicaid, who signed a contract to accept Medicaid. But when you try to get an appointment with them, 56% of the primary care doctors and 45% of the specialists who said they accept Medicaid don't accept Medicaid. You can imagine how few doctors now really accept new Medicaid patients. Expand it all you want, it's not going to be of any value. The other thing we know about Medicaid and the idea of expanding Medicaid is that in the study, the single randomized study where you take half People with no insurance, half of them get Medicaid, half of them get nothing, and they stay with no insurance. What's the impact? Medicaid failed to improve physical health at all beyond no insurance. What's the purpose of the healthcare system if it's not to improve health? In addition, when we look closely at the medical literature, which I did, and you look at the major best journals in the world, Annals of Surgery, Cancer, American Journal of Cardiology, they all show the same thing. People on Medicaid do worse than people who have private insurance, even if you control for the same sickness and everything else. Okay, how do I know? These are the articles, okay? What about Medicaid shopping? I, I say that we should change it to the same kind of program that we, that we want to have for everybody else. Well, 60% of Medicaid expenditures are elective outpatient care. Medicaid reform is already being led pre this administration, and a lot of it was based on SEMA Verma. Move toward private insurance models, even HSAs, requiring a copay. And you say, well, how can you, how can you say you should have a copay if you're poor? Well, we're talking about $1. Because it turns out that when even people have one dollar that they're required to pay, they think about using something. This is very important. There have been two major reforms that have been at least attempted to be put through, and I'm not going to go through the details. I just want to go through some facts, because you've all heard about the CBO, and you all read the same things that I read, I'm sure. Um, NPR said, oh, the GOP health plan will leave 23 million more uninsured, quoting the CBO. Let's first look at the CBO. The CBO is a bunch of economists that make projections for the government, and they, they advertise themselves as nonpartisan. Okay? By the way, nonpartisan is not a synonym for unbiased. Nonpartisan, if you look it up, and I have a slide in here, but I think I took it out, Nonpartisan means not affiliated with a party. Okay, accuracy of the CBO projections. Let's just look at what they said about Obamacare coverage. We're talking about the Obamacare exchanges. In 2013, they made predictions about how many millions of people will be covered. And then I'm comparing here to what actually happened at the date. Here's what happened. In fact, by 2017, they were off almost triple from the actual fact. Their, their projections are notoriously inaccurate. That's point number one. And to their credit, they know that, and so they revise their projections. So here's an example of how many people will be on Obamacare insurance every year. They made the projection in March 2016. This is millions. 
Then they came out with a new set of projections in January 2017, and you can see there's a tremendous variance. In fact, there's a third less, roughly. Now, then the health care proposals came out from the Republicans earlier this year, months after the January projection. So you'd think, okay, the CBO is going to compare what they project from the Republican plans to their, their baseline projections of Obamacare. That's the purpose of the comparison. And their baseline projection at that point was the January 2017. But no, they didn't do that. They went back to the March 2016. You might say, well, that's convenient because there's almost a 50% increase from January 2007 to the number of people that they're claiming are insured under the current law. Okay, that, that, that should raise an eyebrow, if nothing else, and in fact it did. And one of the representatives wrote a letter saying, well, wh why did you do that? Why wouldn't you compare to your, your latest projections about Obamacare? Just because they're worse? And they said, well, we haven't had time. Okay, look at when they wrote that letter. Nine months later than their projections that showed that Obamacare wasn't going to cover as many people. But they went back to a, the previous iteration of their own projection. I don't know if I'm articulating that well enough, but that to me is really a disgrace. Now, there's another thing that happened, and that is projections about Medicaid spending by the Republican proposals, the program for poor people. This is the amount of money, $393 billion, spent this year on Medicaid. That's a fact, that's not a projection. The, pro the projections of CBO came out, and the New York Times said, Senate health care bill includes deep cuts to Medicaid. And Chuck Schumer, the Senate minority leader, said, this, the Republican proposal slashes Medicaid, quote unquote, the way this bill cuts Medicaid health care is heartless. This is the projection of the CBO itself on the spending on Medicaid. Does anyone think that this equates with a heartless deep cut? This curve is going up. It's not going down, in case anyone noticed. The CBO set a false baseline for Medicaid coverage in addition to what I said. First, they assumed for the current law that all states have expanded Medicaid, even though only 31 states did. But they claimed in their projection to compare the Republican plan to Obamacare that all the states have expanded and that 80% of everyone who's even eligible in all the states enrolled, even though this is simply not the case. In addition, they claimed that millions of people will not enroll in the GOP Medicaid program uh, because, just because they might think they're subject to penalties, even though they're not. I mean, there's really, you have, to, you have to be careful about what you read is the point. Reform 6 strategically enhances the supply of medical care and incentivize innovation. I think there's a lot of ways to do this. It's very important if people are going to shop for care. If they want to have choices, you have to have enough supply. And one way to do it is to increase the ability of nurse practitioners and physician assistants to deliver very simple care. Another uh, thing to note is that the medical field itself has put in harmful, restrictive uh, constraints on the number of specialists trained, including residents, uh, and that's, that's a bad thing. Uh, I'm going to go through quickly here. Why not cap drug prices? There's a couple things I want to cover. Because when you cap the price of a good, it is historical fact that the supply of that good becomes restricted. And actually, that happens in drugs. We know it does. In fact, there's a body of literature showing it. Price control strongly delay new drugs launched, significantly diminish new drug early R&D, substantially reduce new drugs being developed. And in fact, the calculations are that the financial benefit from the new drugs far exceeds the savings from capping prices. So I think you better be careful what you ask for if you believe that drug prices should be capped. The way to work on drugs is to really increase competition. When we see this curve, when you introduce one generic, the price comes down slightly. When you introduce even a second generic drug, the price of a drug comes down 50%. I mean, it's quite remarkable what competition does to prices. Um, I'm going to go through here quickly because I want to get to the final section here. 
Kennedy said the great enemy of the truth is very often not the lie, but the myth. And Bernie Sanders, in his campaign and now, says, shamefully, the United States remains the only major country on earth that does not guarantee health care to all people. The only long-term solution is a single-payer national health care system. This says, ceci n'est pas un peep. Okay? We have art people in the audience here who understand this is surrealism. But uh, this means this is not a pipe. Why is that not a pipe? Because it's a picture of a pipe. Health insurance is not health care. I've explained this already in our own current system. Okay? And we know it's not by looking at the countries who have horrendous health care and guarantee in their constitution free health care for all. This is 1936 USSR constitution. Free health care for all. I've been to Moscow, I've been to their cities, I've seen their health care, and that's anecdotal, but I mean, it's, it's not anything remotely the level of the United States. This is Venezuela's constitution. They guarantee health care is a right, and it has to be, quote, free. We have a single-payer system. It's the VA, and the VA is a disgrace, and everybody knows it, I've worked in a VA. Everybody knows the data on the unconscionable waits for care, people dying as they're waiting. What is the solution, even here? The solution is to allow veterans to receive care from private hospitals. That's the solution. We're the only country in the world that is moving toward single payer. The countries that have single payer are not only not moving more towards single payer, the solution for their failures is taking taxpayer money and paying for private health care. Single payer systems are worse by the data. This is not an assertion. I, if anyone's interested, they could look me up. I wrote a piece about 10 days ago, it's on CNN, on the facts about single payer, the data. There's a bunch of hyperlinks in there. Single-payer systems have massive waiting lists and dangerous delays for doctor appointments, life-threatening delays for treatment, even for urgent cancer care. Okay, 19% of people in the UK's NHS system that are referred for urgent cancer treatment, quote unquote, 19% wait more than two months to get their first treatment. 20% of people who need a brain tumor operated on in the UK, 20% wait more than four months to see the neurosurgeon after the diagnosis is made. These weights are never, literally never, found in the United States. Those single-payer systems have delayed availability of drugs that are important, worse availability of screening tests, and last but certainly not least, worse outcomes from all serious diseases. Sweden and the other countries are privatizing after decades of single-payer care. Sweden has privatized all their pharmacies. They privatized some of their extended care facilities, and they're doing more and more. And even though a family of four pays over $20,000 a year in taxes in Sweden for their national system, 600,000 Swedes also buy private insurance. Same deal with the rest of the European systems that are single payer. And England, I'm not going to quote the statistics because I already did, but notice that the NHS paid over $8 billion for private care recently. This is a very funny quote. DeepMind, a Google spinoff in the UK, <laughs> says the NHS in 2017 still retains the dubious title of being the world's largest produce, uh, purchaser of fax machines. That's there to there. Okay, last couple slides, Ex expectations in healthcare. This is uh, survey data that I haven't shown anybody. We did a seven country, six country, it's actually seven, I don't know why there's six flags here. Importance of choice. We are not Brits, okay? We are not people that live in Sweden or Canada. Why do I say that? Well, if you ask people what they want, how important are things like choice? Even if you disregarded the economic things that I've shown you, 
How important is the ability to choose which doctors will perform medical procedures on you? This is British citizens. Extremely very important, somewhat important, not very important, important, uh, not important at all. This is the United States. Okay, we care about that. Access to latest drugs. This is the United States. These are statistically significant differences. There's a shift to the left. We think things are extremely important. Access to latest medical technology. This is the United States compared to Britain. What about wait times? Suppose, this is exactly the way I worded the question here. This is a quote. <clears throat> Suppose you needed non-emergency heart surgery to prevent a serious heart condition. What is the maximum amount of wait time? Okay, in the US, 52% of people say that will, it's only acceptable to wait less than or equal to one week. Brits, 70% of people say, yeah, no problem, a month or more, it's fine. Okay. What about cataract surgery because you were, quote, unable to drive or live independently until the surgery? Okay, 63%, almost two-thirds of Americans said only one week is acceptable. Brits, 70% say, yeah, a month or more. <laughs> Diagnostic MRI scan for non-emergency but a serious underlying condition. 73% of Americans said they're only willing to wait less than or equal to one week. Brits, 60% of people say a month or more. Heart surgery, but while waiting for surgery, you could possibly suffer a heart attack or die. Almost 90% of Americans said, okay, only one week is acceptable. Brits, 25% said a month or more. Okay, we are not Brits. Last point. We hear all the time, and I showed it, that 80% of Americans roughly think that the system needs fundamental change or complete rebuilding. No one shows you the rest of that study, because here's the other countries in that study, almost the same percent of people, not exactly, but pretty close, say their system needs fundamental change or complete rebuilding. Two take home messages that I think are very important. Reforming Medicaid, which is a sort of a hot topic in the, in the literature these days in terms of the news, Successful Medicaid reform depends on reforms to the entire system. We want an integrated system. Poor people want the same medical care as everybody else. There's zero, to me, ethical justification for having them have some sort of bad system that we would never want and thinking that you did something great. Because you're spending five to seven hundred billion dollars a year on that system. It's not free. Secondly, the poor will be the ones who suffer the most if somehow we move toward a single payer system because only they will be unable to circumvent that system. Last slide is from Milton Friedman who uh, he had his office down the hall from mine when he was at Hoover. One of the great mistakes is to judge policies and programs by their intentions rather than their results. Okay, thank you very much.